It's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the Double Stop Podcast. I'm Brian Sword. This week, we've got guitarist Sean Kelly, who recently released a book on the history of Canadian rock music called Metal on Ice. Plus, he plays in a ton of other bands, including Helix and 4x Fate, the new band with Todd Howarth and John Regan from Freely's Comet. As always, we'll start at the beginning and take it right up to present day. Here's my conversation with Sean Kelly. So I don't want to cover too much ground that was that was covered in the book, but in, in terms of when you decided to make the move down to Toronto, I believe that's where you would have gone from from North Bay. Uh, that's right. How old were you, and what made what what made that decision for you? Well, um, going back, I was 18 when I moved to Toronto, and the reason I moved to Toronto uh, was because initially, what my game plan was when I was done high school, I actually wanted to move to Los Angeles. I was ready to kind of throw all my eggs in one basket and move to LA. But uh, you know, financial reasons, I didn't have any dough, and uh, and 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 going down there to to kind of starve wasn't necessarily the best option. Uh, fortunately, I have very support parents who are, who are very smart, and they kind of, they rationalize, well, look, you do pretty well in school. Why don't you go someplace and study music in Canada? We'll help you out. You can get an education, which is important to them, and you can still be in a big city where there's a scene. So I actually uh, auditioned for classical guitar at McGill in Montreal and U of e in Toronto, uh, for classical guitar, and I got into both places, fortunately. Uh, but I decided I picked Toronto because at the time, Meat Magazine was a publication that had made its way up north. Uh, Drew Masters had a, had a magazine, metal event around Toronto. And oh, I thought, I yeah. yeah, and I saw what was a burgeoning happening in Toronto. I said, well, look at this is like the LA of Canada. There are great bands happening here, and uh, venues like the Gas Works and Rock and Roll Heaven. And to me, it just kind of made sense. And, you know, I've always been uh, a pragmatic guy anyway. Like, even when I was playing in kind of CD bars when I was 15, 16, I was also still, like, president of my students' council at school. I, I was an academic. I, I, and I, I dig that. That's a genuine part of who I am. Um, so, you know, it was, it was funny. Going to Catholic school during the week and then going to the exact opposite end of that spectrum for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um but yeah, that's what that's what brought me to Toronto, and uh, and I don't regret it. It was a great decision. And you do bring up the classical guitar, and and obviously you have a bunch of classical guitar albums, which we'll get to. Yes. But yeah, where did that start? So while you were in North Bay, training, you know, to be a metalhead, you must have yeah. also been training on your classical. Well, here's the honest truth. I. Um, you know, sometimes it was easier for me to get access to guitar magazines and actual albums up north. You uh-huh. know, Shoppers Drug Mart would actually have the uh, have the magazine, the Guitar Worlds and, and whatnot in stock. But sometimes it was harder to get the actual record. So I actually read more about musicians sometimes and listened to them, like Ingve Malmsteen, for example. So I'm I'm reading about Ingve, right? And I'm going, wow, classical. This guy looks cool. And he's into classical. And I'd heard a little bit. So I went to my guitar teacher as a young guy, and I said, you know, I, I want to get into this classical thing. And he said, oh, okay, here you go. And he gives me this guitar with, like, you know, a super wide neck and nylon strings. And I'm going, oh, okay. Well, it didn't quite look like what Ingve was playing, but okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I got into it. But to be, to be perfectly honest, um, while I, I, I did enjoy it, I, it was always a means to an end. It was a means to an end to uh better my rock playing and 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 i I, and to be honest i still view it that way really it's uh i i I do love playing classical guitar but really i'm a rock guitar player who's classically trained not a classical guitarist who plays rock i think that that's a big difference and clearly it's gonna help with hand strength and all kinds of you know if you can do it on that guitar you can an electric is you know walk in the park where it's really helped me as a player is in studio work and i get the comments from producers it's it, it's it's the clarity uh, because in a classical guitar, like you are the tone production mechanism, right? Um, you're you're not, you're not running through processors or amplifiers or tubes. You are generating all those tones. And I think 
when you develop that kind of aesthetic and that approach to playing guitar, it translates over to electric guitar. And, and, and even to this day, I use very minimal effects and processing. I, I'm really utilizing the tonal spectrum of the instrument itself. I like to keep it real simple. A little bit more of the Angus Young's side of things. You know, Angus is perfect. I got my rhythm on seven. I got my lead. I go on 10, and then I just play harder if I need more sustain. <laughs> <laughs> and it works good, well for me because technologically, I, I've got my issues. So <laughs> so when you hit the Tron when you hit Toronto, yep. what happened? Did, did you form Crash Kelly right away, or did you bounce around a bit? No. Well, the first thing I did was I, I went to U of T, and I realized, wow. I'm way over my head here. I could barely read oh, okay. music, but I had managed to, I had managed to kind of learn some tough pieces to get in on the audition and you know, blag my way through and get into the to the school, but there were like serious classical players there. And I was like, "Wow, like this is crazy, right?" But what I did was I uh, I got there and you got to remember this is 91. So I just found the guys with the longest hair at the music faculty, and I figured, yeah, they must be rockers. And I actually found a bass player named Mike Tetro, who was a French horn player. His brother Joe was a saxophone player, but he was so good looking and his hair was so cool. I convinced him to be the lead singer, <laughs> convinced Mike to be the bass player. And then I found a guy who was living at my residence to play drums, Rob Terrian, and we formed a band called Obscured. And uh, that band uh, was very aptly titled because you've never heard of them and not many people have. But um, uh, what we did have going for us was we actually, like I think our first gig was opening for a band on Anthem called Psycho Circus. So my first gig in Toronto, or second gig maybe, was playing at the Gasworks, you know, opening for a signed band. And... Jamie Stewart, the bass player from the cult, saw us play. And we ended up making a demo. So I'm thinking, hey, man, this is easy. You move to a big city. You meet some guys who look cool. You learn enough songs to, you know, go out and play. And some guy wants to work with you. <laughs> so I thought it was pretty cool. Next thing you know, we're talking to record companies and making demos. And we've got a, a manager. And, you know, all these kind of fun things are happening. Um, but what we didn't have was good songs, unfortunately, <laughs> so we didn't really go anywhere. Uh, but it was a great first step into the business, and I I'm, I'm, was really grateful. And I mean, to me, I just couldn't believe I was working with someone like Jamie, like someone whose albums I had, and like, yeah. you know, it, it blew me away. So th that started, that's, yeah, that was a band called Obscured. And that's right around the start of Grunge, too. Well, you know, it's funny. It, it, it really is. And, and you know... It wasn't necessarily as black and white, uh, you know, as, as some people paint it out to be. You got to remember when Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains were coming along, to us it was kind of like just the next, and Jane's Addiction, the next extension of what hard rock was, right? Yeah. No one told the people who were playing hard rock that they were going to be uh, ultimately uncool <laughs> in yeah, a few months. True. You know, uh, it, it, it just kind of came along but what the aesthetic did change quickly for me it was nirvana and uh yeah i mean i i even say this in the book first time i heard smells like teen spirit the first thing that struck me was i couldn't be wearing these cowboy boots with the buckles anymore it's a weird thing to say mm. but i looked it was like it woke me up and i looked around and i realized the tides had changed and i was so bummed because i'd finally gotten that look together you know i'd finally <laughs> Look, in North Bay, you got to go to the woman's section in Woco to get anything that's close to like a Bon Jovi, right? Like we, I had to work hard to figure that stuff out. It wasn't like living in a big city. Uh, so as stupid as it sounds, it was a real, real turning point. Um, and, you know, sure enough, man, like uh, we started, you know, I started to try and change in that aesthetic. And But what you can't ultimately change is who you are musically. And I struggled because... I play a certain way. I grew up on Warren DeMartini and Eddie Van Halen and George Lynch. And, and while I'm no sure, I, there's a certain touch that I have that's, you know, yeah. a, like coming from a lead guitarist stack, right? Um, so I had to really work hard to not be me for a while there. <laughs> and we all know that that doesn't really work out. But I did, um, later on, about halfway through university, I did have a fortuitous meeting with um I, I had moved into an apartment by that point and the guy who lived upstairs for me I could hear him jamming we started talking i heard this amazing singer and it turned out to be a guy named dale martindale from a band called images in vogue who uh were a big big canadian new wave band 
they weren't really on my radar as a kid, but I uh, I just loved Dale's voice, and we ended up um, forming a band called uh, 69 Duster, and ended up moving to Vancouver and had a little development publishing deal, and you know, kind of went through that process, and that's where I really learned a lot from Dale in terms of writing and becoming a writer and uh, and going through the process of putting a band together and independent deals and all that. Stuff. Why would you move to Vancouver from Toronto when Toronto's got a bigger scene? Well, the reason was Dale was moving, and I said, "Well, look at I, I, you know, when you're in your early twenties, you think that, uh, you know, your shots are going to be limited, right? I, I had that deep desire to, to have a career in music. I said, "Look at when am I ever going to meet a guy who actually had a re- major label record deal again?" Uh, mm-hmm. And he was moving out there. He'd already had plans to move out there. So what I ended up doing was transferring all my credits over to <laughs> University of British Columbia, and I studied classical guitar out there. And I have to tell you, uh, aside from the fact that moving out to Vancouver and kind of going through that experience of moving and, and working with Dale and putting a band together out there, um, as much as that was valuable, going to another school was really amazing. I, uh, UBC has a very different vibe or had a very different vibe than U of T. U of T was very competitive and uh ubc was just very opening and it was like wow i can jam with classical guitar players you're actually asking me to jam with you um and it was such a cool vibe you know it was it's that that west coast vibe kind of rubbed off on me and and i i uh, I, I actually ended up uh it was funny my my teacher at the time he knew my heart really wasn't into being a classical guitar performer and he saw that i had stuff going on so he said look it you, you want to get this credit Take some of my wedding gigs from me. I'll give you a commission because I don't feel like driving out to New Westminster every weekend. And uh, he goes, you, you got your business at Acumen together. Go, go take care of it. So that was my deal. I didn't really have to learn the crazy hard final year pieces because I, I just took this guy's gig. <laughs> and it was and, – and to me, what a great way to teach. He saw I was going down a path. He – prepped me for it and uh and i'm really grateful for it and and had a great time out there but like you said uh we actually ended up finding all our record company interest for 69 duster was coming from toronto so we we ended up moving back after a year and dale moved back too dale moved back too and uh you know we we gave a 69 duster gave it a good kick at the can we ended up signing with uh an independent company here in toronto called rcd music and we put out a couple of records and toured uh, but it just couldn't seem to, you know, break through the, to that to that next level. Um, and Dale is now doing quite well again. Images of Vogue's back. He's he's playing. I, I you know I I love Dale and uh, I'm very grateful for that experience I had. We had two records out. One called Mania, and one called Ride. And and I, I threw those on the other day. I'm still very proud of those albums. So what happened? Uh, what what happened after the that band dissolved? Well, kind of concurrently, like that band kind of. You know, it was a slow death. <laughs> we kept kind of keeping it together for the for the sake of the kids, I guess. <laughs> but uh, but I was playing in a number of bands. I became uh, some people would call it a guitar whore. I was playing with anybody and everybody I could. I I played with um, a guy named Chad Richardson, who ended up uh, we went ended up winning the Q107 Homegrown Contest in oh, cool. 1997. Yeah, and that was cool. And we got a deal with Aquarius Records and. That was my first kind of uh, bigger label experience, like going and sitting in an office and seeing the April Wine and Corey Hart gold albums and saying, wow, cool, you know, here we are. And I'll never forget that because we toured out east, we toured out west, we came home and we got dropped. <laughs> oh, really? It was, oh yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was quick and, and painless. But, um, but I will say this, Chad has gone on to a wonderful career as a songwriter and he was a creative manager at Ole Publishing, responsible for signing like Steven Tyler and and Timbaland and a bunch of people. Now he's a general manager of SoCan in Los Angeles. So Chad has, has gone on to wonderful things. He was a star of a Broadway musical called Rent. Uh, really wonderful guy. So I have great memories and we're, we're still good friends. Uh, played with him. I was in a band called Vibrolux that had some, some success. Um, once again, touring, you know, management. Uh, um, uh, the, the most famous tour I did with them, famous in my mind, is uh, we did this thing called the Pepsi Taste Tour that took us across the And I'll never forget, we were really the soundtrack for, I don't even know if this is legal anymore, but we were the soundtrack for little kids basically chugging as much Pepsi as they could in, in bars during the daytime. 
and we it was a bizarre tour. We <laughs> we went out with uh, it was us and Matthew Good, Lim Lifter, and Astero. I think um, interesting, interesting times. So playing with them, and um, yeah, I'm trying to think who else. I was in a band called Heater as well. Kind of you know had our shot at uh, you know your label interest in the U.S. and you know, kind of just kept struggling along. And in the meantime, did a few sessions. I did a Wild Strawberries record. Uh, I, I've never unsuccessfully auditioned for a band more than Wild Strawberries. I, I kept getting the gig and losing the gig. Um, How so? Mostly, well, mostly because Sarah McLaughlin's guitar player kept becoming available. But then finally I went and another guy just beat me out for it. I said, I think God's trying to tell me I'm not supposed to play in Wild Strawberries. <laughs> But uh, but once again, you know, gave me a chance to get a credit on a on a big album and uh, sure. through network and you know I just kept looking at like hey if I just keep building this little ball of aluminum foil, you know maybe something's gonna happen and and what I realize now in going through all of that was what I was really doing was gaining experience you know and that was the value in it, it was mm -hmm. you know I had already been out on tour about five or six times uh, at that point like across and and doing it kind of the hard way but. You know, kind of getting a little better every time. And and how old would you be about this time? Well, I guess you know, I, I'm moving up through '99 here. By the time I had kind of finished the Vibrolux thing, that was '98, '99. I was, I think, I was 26 or 27, 26 because I remember coming home from one. Said, you know, I'm really poor, <laughs> and <laughs> I I've got this. You know, I said it's got to be a way. I can use this education I got to make a little more money. So I, I'd been teaching guitar, but I said, I'm going to take a year and I'm going to go to teacher's college. Cause once again, I'm a pragmatic guy. Mm -hmm. So I took that year. I, I, I ended up going out, uh, going back to North Bay, did a year at teacher's college. Absolutely loved it by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I had no goal of ever being a teacher. I said, I'll supply teach. This was my, my master plan. Um, and I'll t and I, and I ended up moving back to Toronto, and of course I ended up taking a teaching gig and uh, teaching vocal music with the Toronto Catholic Teacher School Board. Something I still do to this day, although in a very uh, minimal capacity. But um, but what that gave me, Brian, was the freedom to do whatever the hell I wanted to do. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, I got a gig. I don't need to be out on the road right now. I'm just going to make a record that makes me happy. And that's where Crash Kelly came from. I said, what's the record I don't have on my record player that I, or on my, my CD shelf that I want to listen to? And, it, and the answer was a bit of Cheap Trick, a bit of Queen, a bit of Early Rat and Motley Crue. I wanted this kind of 70s glam rock, it's 80s Sunset Strip, early 80s Sunset Strip. Mm -hmm. thing. And I just did it. I, I, I made this record with a friend of mine for 1500 bucks. And that was the best 1500 bucks I ever spent because I not only found my musical identity, I rediscovered my musical identity, I should say. I, you know, sold quite a few copies of that little record with licensing deals all around the world, and it started uh, a path that I'm on right now. Yeah, it was funny. When I finished the book, I went back and started looking at some of the Crash Kelly videos. Um, yeah. Because I wasn't really too, too aware of, of what you were doing with that band. And I just read the comments on, on YouTube and was like, he was my teacher. He was my teacher. All, all your students were all like cheering you on. Well, you, you got to remember, too, this is the dawn of the Internet, too, right? Like this is when all of a sudden kids can go online and see what Mr. Kelly's up to. And, and yeah, then... yeah. <laughs> so it was pretty cool, though. And, it, and uh, that was a great experience because uh, I, I got to tell you, the Toronto Catholic District School Board has to be one of the hippest boards ever because... You know, when you're walking and tell your principal you're going on tour with Alice Cooper for four weeks, <laughs> can I have time off? They would just shake their head, but they all they let me. Like, you know, like they would give me time off to go tour. I took uh, a year off when Crash Kelly signed with Century Media with uh, the Liquor Poker imprint. Because we toured quite a bit. We went to Europe three times, toured the U.S., did the Cooper tour in North America. Like, we were out for quite a bit. Um, so I was leading this double life. <laughs> so along that way... Is that when you also started doing more session work on the side? Well, yeah, you know, the, the, I, I, once again, the more that you're involved in the business, 
you, you keep making contacts as you go along and friends of yours, like, you know, a good friend of mine who was a bass player in 69 Duster and who I actually went to university with, uh, a guy named Craig McConnell, he ended up building a home studio, getting a lot of studio work. And I ended up playing a lot of uh, major label R&B records with him because uh, he was getting into the producing world. And, you know, I was just his buddy who played guitar. So, yeah, cool. And then I, then I found I had a knack for it. So I was, I was doing more session work. Uh, you know, running into people who were involved in jingles and things like that and getting a little bit of that work. So kind of building up that side of things too. And just the massive networking that would come with that as well. Well, yeah. And, you know, really, once you're kind of established in a city, like the Canadian music industry isn't that big, you know. And, and, uh, you know, once you're kind of in and you go along and you follow the – there's three rules to success that my buddy Tim Walsh told me. Um, Try to be as good looking as you can. Uh, be nice to everybody and don't suck. <laughs> if you follow in those that order? three things, uh, no, no, that you can mix them up depending <laughs> on uh, situation. But you know, if you follow those things, like I mean, you know, you got a pretty good shot of of, yeah. of doing something, right? Like, and and, and don't quit. <laughs> That's Brian yeah. Ballmer's goal. Don't quit. If you don't quit, you know, people are people are good at doing that. So. If you manage to stick it out, you know, opportunities will come up. Especially when you have something to fall back on, like a teaching degree. Yeah, and you know, I, I kind of approach the teaching thing like I do the music thing. I didn't really ever look at it like falling back on it. I said, I'm going to do this. This is going to be a part of my music career. So I, you know, I go in there with those kids, and I try and give them the best quality musical education I can, make it as hip as I can, be true to myself, and, and, and that's the way I look at everything. No matter what gig I'm doing. If I'm doing a country gig, a uh, country album, I'm going to go with there. If I'm doing a classical record, I'm going to dive in like that. That's kind of the way I always approached it. It's all part of one big music career. And, and you're still teaching now? I am. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, teaching one day a week after been, having been on a four-year hiatus from teaching at all because I was on tour with Nelly Furtado. Um, but I, uh, I am teaching. And also, I work for a company called Coalition Music here in Toronto. Um, Coalition manages Our Lady Peace, Simple Plan, Finger Eleven, a host of other bands. Uh, but they also have an education division that uh, I'm heavily involved in um, as a team member. And uh, I'm an ins- one of the head instructors of the Artist Entrepreneur Program. Um, I teach the high school music business course that's actually run through the Toronto Catholic District School Board as well. So that's where Coalition is a place where everything comes it really is a coalition <laughs> it's a coalition of of all these things really because i'm uh that's a place where there's a f- uh, i don't know if you're familiar with the, the the company but there's a we have a facility that houses a classroom uh a, f- a full recording studio with a neve console a live production room um and then of course the label and management offices so on any given day i could be music directing a major label artist doing a session, teaching a class, <laughs> building wow. curriculum. You never know. And it's its wonderful. So with Crash Kelly, you, you did quite a few records, 2000, early 2000s to mid-2000s. And you started doing classical guitar records as well. And they, they seem to kind of overlap here a little bit. But what, what led you down that road? All, obviously, you were trained, but what made you decide to put up some records? Well, here's this is just one of those situations where you have to put yourself out there for something to happen. Uh, I was also, while I was teaching school, teaching guitar at a place called Lippert Music Center. That's run by a, a good friend of mine, Charlene Lippert Beard. And um, I was teaching guitar there. And for years, I taught classical guitar to a young guy by the name of Daniel McKercher. And Daniel was a, a fine student and was really into it. And his dad would always sit in on the lessons. And, and we developed the friendship just from him coming to the lessons, and I knew he was a musician too. But what I didn't know was he was a director of classics for Universal Music in Canada. Oh. And one day, yeah, one day he goes, you know, you ever think of putting out a classical album? I went, man, eh, not really. He goes, oh, well, you should, you know, you could do like the greatest hits of the classical guitar. I said, oh, yeah. He goes, well, yeah, I'd like to put that out. <laughs> I went, really? So, you know, we ended up going through the Universal pipeline, but... um what we were actually doing was, was going with one of their subsidiary labels, which was a company called Opening Day. 
And the reason being was Tom really liked working with this label because it was run by uh, Chuck Dallenbach, who is the founder of the Canadian Brass. And he said, Chuck, Chuck's a really cool guy, really sees things outside, you know. So we had all the Universal's marketing power, but we had this cool boutique label. And, um, you know, I met with them and they thought it was a crazy idea. The rock guy doing the classical record. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Um, not only was the record a hit, like we, we sold quite a few, it was, it was successful. Um, just going out and being able to be, you know, I, I, I think, I don't think I made the best classical guitar record in the world, not by a long shot, but I know what I did do was I was able to serve as a bridge for people to get into classical music because there is this kind of intimidation factor sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is. And I felt that, you know, like I kind of made it a little more accessible and I'm very proud of the record. I think we made a great record. Um, but that's what I really feel like I did. I think I, I, I made, I was able to make it a little more accessible to people because it's beautiful music. And, uh, and so we made that record number one classical guitar album, which is part of a series Universal had. Um, then actually ended up making uh, a Christmas guitar record that was that charted in the U.S. Billboard charts in the top ten, which mm. was you know yeah a, a, an amazing thing to have happen. And yeah. from there went on and made uh, a kind of a, a fusion record, uh, classical guitar pieces, but reinterpreted with rock arrangements called "Where the Wood Meets the Wire," and I actually am just about to release the fourth album in that guitar series, um, Guitar Melodica, which is. Uh, an album for two classical guitars and French horn. So yeah, still an ongoing thing. <laughs> and did releasing those albums, did it change the way you were viewed within the industry? I think so. You know, it was, it, it was cool. I actually ended up doing a, a great endorsement deal with Yamaha. Uh, my rep there at the time was a guy named Chris Selden and Chris, Chris is a great player too, but he knew me from the bars, but he was a guitar rep for Yamaha and they were looking for someone to push their new line of classical guitars. Uh -huh. and, but they wanted to, to market it to people who weren't classical players. So he was listening to the classical radio station here one day and he heard one of my pieces. He goes, that can't be the same Sean Kelly plays in Cratch Kelly. And sure enough, he heard it was. And that ended up, uh, they actually built a website for me, classicrocks.ca. And you could actually get my album free if you bought a guitar. It was a really cool program we did. Uh, did some clinics for them. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah it's, just, yeah, it's just interesting how when you when you do things kind of for the right reasons and it just all usually unexpected doors open because of it. Well, you, you know what? I think so. And, and, and I think the best thing I did was I didn't try and fool anybody. Um, mm -hmm. I, first thing I said was, look, it, there are people who have dedicated their lives to this. I've dedicated my life to playing guitar and making music, but please check out these players. And I, even on the last uh, classical record I did, I had a virtuoso player, a good friend of mine, Mike, Michael Kolk, K O L K. Um, he, he, he is one of the best classical guitarists in the world, bar none. Uh, you know, playing second fiddle is usually a pejorative term, but I'll tell you, I was quite proud to play second guitar on this two guitar record because here and Michael play is such a treat, you know, and that's what it's important. You have to, you know, point out the people who are doing real beautiful work. And yeah. if I can keep doing that with this guitar series, I'd be very happy. And, and it's interesting because for you get those virtuosos, they'll see you and they'll know that, that you're not fully dedicated to it, but they also know that you're crossing over and you're bringing an audience with you that, you know, you, you are helping the cause. For sure. And, and he, Hey, listen, man, I'll, I'll I'll, I might not win the fight, but I'll go in swinging. Like, you know, I'm not, I don't mean to put myself down. <laughs> I'm, I'm always going in to, to do the best I can. And, and I, I do love it and I play from the heart. Uh, but, but, but why not highlight the talents of other people? It's such a, it's such a great opportunity. And, and I hope to do more of that. Now tell me about the Crash Kelly. Why you decided to, to disband that? And is that permanently disbanded or did you just tuck it away on hiatus for a while? No, you know, it, it, it's a funny thing, Brian. I love that band. That band, I actually felt like my dreams came true in a lot of way with that band. You know, I got to play in arenas. I got to play with big acts. I, we didn't sell a ton of records, but we, you know, I, I, I did get to do exactly what I wanted to do and, mm -hmm. and, and, and have people support it. Um, 
I don't think it's done, but but there's a couple of things. Number one, I never wanted to be a lead singer. I was a singer in that band because I was the only one I think who could have done it at the time. I just needed to have that autonomy to go out and, and sing my songs, play my songs the way I wanted to be played. If I could have found a beautiful singer who could have who would have done exactly what I wanted them to, <laughs> I would have probably found them. But I I did it and I'm I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot doing it. Uh, that's one reason. Uh, the other reason was, you know, I started to get opportunities that were more lucrative. And and I saw that in life, I have to make choices. There's certain things I wanted in life. I, I'm, a, I'm a married guy. I've got a young, a young son. And I knew I wanted to have a family. And I, I still wanted to play at a very high level. And being a side guy let me play on a very high level. Um, and where as the Crash Kelly thing, I would have had to continue to make sacrifices that wouldn't have necessarily lined up with uh, uh, the other facets of my life that I wanted to have happen. That's the truth. Um, artistically, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if, I, if I'm going to go back down that road because right now the, the greatest joy I get is in writing for great singers and playing with amazing singers. Like I am never happier musically than when I am – playing guitar behind an incredible singer. And I've been so blessed to work with some of the best around. So that's what it really gets me off right now. Um, but, I, but I'm so honored that people enjoyed the Crash Kelly music. Like, you know, we did have a, a pretty good, good underground fan fall. And who knows, maybe one day I'm going to feel that desire to get out and do one. So I, I'm, I'm leaving the door open. You are the, um, my fifth interview for this show, which is, you know, still in its early stages. And you are the third out of five who has played in Helix. <laughs> right on. <laughs> who else? Oh, you, you, had, you had Phrase on, I guess, right? I had Phrase on and, and I had Darren Smith on. And he played oh, great, guitar man. for a while. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, well, Helix, near and dear to my heart. It's one of those bands that you grew up with. You know, I'm sure you saw them play. I think you talked about it in your book about seeing them play in North Bay. First concert I ever saw. Yeah, and now all of a sudden you're, you know, you have an opportunity to join the band. How did that happen? That happened because I I bugged Brian Vollmer for so long he eventually gave. In. <laughs> <laughs> but also, where cre credit where credit is due, Mitch Lafone, my buddy Mitch Lafone, journalist and and mm. and, and music lover and. I call Mitch is like uh, he's like a spider web of connectivity, right? He's bringing people together. Um, but yeah, I I, I must have emailed Almer a hundred times trying to get in that band. And you know, Brian was always very very nice to get back to me, but always look, I'm not interested. Got a guitar player? <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> no, he was he was really cool about it. But uh, the, a bass playing slot opened up, and it's funny, you know, I. I never kind of set out to be a bass player, but I've I've been, I've played bass with Gilby Clark, Rough Trade, um, Alex Johnson, Pops. Like I, I do a lot of bass gigs. I actually just wrote a column in the New Canadian Musician on guitar players playing bass. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I had a chance to play bass, and I, I was pretty comfortable with my bass playing at that point. Uh, you know, in a Pete way from UFO sort of way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I can, I, 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 I can get the job done. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how it came about, and of course I was thrilled. Like the audition, I I couldn't stop grinning because I'm looking at Brett Turner, Brian Vollmer playing, and I'm just going, I'm fucking playing heavy. Oh sorry, I didn't mean to swear. I'm playing heavy metal, love, with Helix. Like that was mind blowing, you know. So we we jammed out a few songs and got the gig and. First gig was uh, in Peterborough. Then we we're off to Rock, Oklahoma to play with all these big bands on a massive stage. I was like, "Yeah, baby, this is great." And uh, you know, it's funny. The first thing Brian told me, he said, "Hey, look at you're not going to be involved in the writing. You're not going to be playing on any albums. I'm just letting you know. This is how it goes down." I said, "Hey, no problem. Just happy to be in the band." And of course, now I've been partners with Brian in in, in Helix Records for the last you know four years. And and actually, you know, we just we. Uh, hitting the studio on Tuesday for the new Helix record and uh, so proud of it. And it's turned into 
a wonderful situation where I actually feel like Brian's uh, a, a great friend and a great mentor and, and, and we have a great writing relationship and man, talk, I get to, I get to co-produce and play guitar on Helix records. It's, it's, it's mind blowing to me. And leaving that band was one of the hardest things I've ever done ever in my life. On, so for the records you've been involved with, like say, starting with Vagabond Bones, did you play only yeah. bass on that or did you play guitar as well? No, I played, to be honest, the majority of the guitars on, on that yeah. record and, and a lot of the bass. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's just a, a really uh, a function of practicality. But also, I, I you know, it's funny. You have a guy like Brent Derner. Brent is one of the best guitar players in Canada. But he's so devoid of ego, he doesn't really care if he's on the record. He, like mm. Brent at that point was really into videography and photography. He was just into being a, capturing those elements. But, you know, I, I insisted he played on <laughs> some of it. I was like, Brent, we need you on this. And every time Brent Turner plays a part, it sounds like Brent Turner. It's amazing. So it was an honor to work with on that record and then on the smash hits unplugged record which was uh actually released through a major label through emi which was uh, really cool um that was fun because we all played together uh caleb duck uh who is uh i want to say new guitar bird but he's been there for four years fantastic young player brent myself and then daryl gray was back in the fold too and fritz on drums like you know, that, that was such a special record for me. And what I really loved about that record and what was important for me to get across was how well these guys sing. Like, there's a vocal blend when you get Derner, Daryl Gray, and Brian Vollmer singing. That's unbelievable. And Fritz, too. Like, these guys can sing. And so that's it, it, that, that record really highlighted the quality of the songs. And, uh, and, of course, we had fun. Brent plays great mandolin. I played some dobro, a little band guitar. Which is the great uh, the great faking tool for <laughs> guitar players that can't be bothered to learn banjo? That saved my bacon on a Nelly Furtado tour, too. I'll tell you. Um, yeah, so did that, and then you know worked on the Skin in the Game EP and some extra tracks. We wrote a, a Leaf song called "All I Want for Christmas Is the Leafs to Win the Cup," which we figure the way things are going will be a perennial <laughs> oh, <I laughs> wish. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm a anyway. I'm a Leafs fan too. Oh, oh God bless. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah man it, it's just been a beautiful beautiful relationship and was it the nella Furtado gig that that made you leave helix it was yeah. it was and uh you know it was such a bizarre opportunity it was so far removed from anything i thought i'd be doing in my yeah. life and, and it came about because um i played in a band with nick walsh too um forgot to mention called revolver uh, which actually morphed into Nick's new band, Famous Underground. But we and and, and Revolver, we had a deal in Europe through Sony, and we had oh. some stuff going on, and we yeah. uh, made made a great record together, Turbulence. Um, but I, I the guitar tech in uh, Revolver is a guy named Damon Enright, and Damon had gone on to work with Nelly as as her tech. And one day we were just talking, and and I said, "Hey, man, we should go for a beer." And he said, "Yeah, cool." Hung up the phone. They phoned me back. He goes, "Hey, you you play Spanish guitar, right?" I went, yeah. And he goes, okay, hold on. He phones me back. He goes, okay, you're going to get a call from Nelly for titles, music director. She just did a Spanish album and looking for someone to do it. I said, oh no, man, that's not for me. I, <laughs> that gig, I, I don't even know. I, I don't, I don't play that kind of music. Right. And he said, oh man, you should check it out. It's pretty cool. I'm going, geez, I never really thought of that. Right. So I get called down and went and played for the music director and he liked my playing. You know, next thing you know, I'm, f I'm four days in and I'm, I'm learning all these songs. It's very different for me. Thank God my wife was a fan and had some of the tunes so I could <laughs> prepare a little bit. And, uh, you know, and uh, then, but, you know, it was such a different thing. Like everything is on a much bigger level. Like we were yeah. in big Sony soundstage and there's all these people around and full arena stage, you know rehearsal mm -hmm. facilities i was like what the hell's going on and then the final day you know nelly comes in and here's here's me play and i don't i don't hear anything and i'm just waiting and fortunately the call came that night that i got the gig and i had to make some decisions you know because we were soon off after that and it was just such a great opportunity to to play professionally 
and, 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 you know, it was, it was fairly lucrative. I won't lie. And, uh, you know, I had to make a tough call, but Brian was very, very understanding. And, you know, we were just finishing up the Vagabond Bones record. And all he asked was that, you know, will you please finish this record with me? And I said, of course. And we got that record done. And, you know, Brian's been so supportive of everything. And, you know, I got to say the coolest thing is last year, we played in Kitchener with Nelly on her Canadian tour. And, uh, you know, she gave a big shout out to Helix from the stage. And <laughs> Brian came backstage after. I was just like, I was like, how cool is this? You know? Yeah. Totally. You know? And yeah, like, you know, it's funny. Even on the on that Canadian tour, I kept bringing all these people. Like Darby Mills came to the Kamloops show. And Nelly's like, wow, you know a lot of rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> She was, she was really, you know, kind of blown up. Uh, and I, I have to tell you this too, Brian. Well, what started off is like a gig that, you know, I, 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 I took just for, for the experience. Nelly is such an incredible musician. I've grown more musically in the years playing with Nelly than, than I have in any other gig. She's really like, when you hear about people using the term musical genius, she actually is. And she's such an incredible musician, so open with letting you be, who you are in the band and encouraging me to bring my rock side out. But it, it's been a wild experience far beyond even like, I mean, sure. It's, it's pretty cool when you're playing in front of 500,000 people. Like that's, that's neat. Yeah. But just the experience of working with her musically is incredible. She's a beautiful person and I can't say enough about her. You know, there's a long history of these amazing guitar players backing pop stars like um like obviously you've got nuno from extreme playing with rihanna you've got steve stevie salas who did all these american idol musical director for a bunch of american idol bands yeah um and then even i remember god it was easily 10 years ago probably longer seeing some awards show or something and in sync is playing and who do i see in the background playing guitar but greg howe from yeah. know, Crapnel days, you know, like it dates back a yeah. long time for these, these pop stars pulling in these amazing shredder guitar players. Um, and it's always been really fascinating to me. Like I recognize that there's the, the financial side that, okay, for Nuno, he gets to have a really great gig so that he can probably afford to resurrect extreme every couple of years. Uh, yeah. Is there more to it than that? And, and I'm starting to get a hint of it from you when you talk about what you've learned playing with, with, with Nelly, but is it as simple as it's a great gig that I can have the freedom to do whatever I want musically after, or is there, is there just more to it? Well, I can't speak for those guys, but for me, like where else would I have had the opportunity to play? Like, for example, I've played in Nelly's band. I played with some incredible drummers, Dave Langeth, who I, who I still work with to this day. He's a drummer on metal on ice. And, and uh, we played together in Gilby Clark's band and, number of other uh, of other uh, scenarios but you know a guy like dave or or nelly's uh current drummer paul john jr who was with alicia keys and and comes from like a church and gospel background played with paul simon you name it and like to be able to absorb that and 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 play uh on on, on those types of gigs and absorb their musicality and where they're coming from it's like going to university all over again. Like I'm getting a whole other skill set just from playing with these guys, right? So yeah, it's I think it, it's far beyond that. And I think too for me now, what it's really given me is being in those kind of high pressure situations, like playing live TV in front of five million people and you're doing a little classical guitar intro. Having been in the hot seat a few times, it has made me kind of a little more resilient. Like I don't really sweat too much anymore, you know, yeah, yeah. like, Hey man, okay. I can do this and not, you know, and, I, and, and, and hold it, hold it down, you know? So there's a confidence factor. I mean, just once again, because Nelly was, has such a, a big global reach to be able to, to, to travel and see the world and, and then play in some of those big historic venues, you know, um, does make for a different type of player. And I, I'm certainly not the most advanced player in the world, um, but I do find that it does help you to be a better communicator. Like you've got to go out there and communicate for 20,000, 40,000 people, you know, and, and bring those ideas across. So there, there, there's so much more at play and it just, just, I think that traveling and, and being part of something so professional and, and, and so big, mm -hmm. 
uh, it just gives you a broader uh, vision of what's out there. And I and I and I know I know I take that to, to the other things I do for sure. But I think there's more to it. You know, it's funny. I met Nuno at a NAM show, and I just finished playing with his drummer. Uh, so I'm really grateful because it just gave me an, ex- an ex- uh, excuse to go talk to Nuno Betancourt. <laughs> So I just hang out with Nuno Betcourt because I can say, hey, man, play with your drummer. You know, hey, that's cool, right? Meanwhile, I'm going, do you know how many times I like nearly wrecked my hands trying to learn licks off pornography when I was oh, a kid? <laughs> he's, and that dude's still not from this world. Oh, he, like, that's that's a whole other level. Like, you know, if Nuno's a guitar player, I'm, I don't know, what am I? A guy who holds a guitar? <laughs> like, I don't know what you <laughs> what the correlation is, but I'm not in that, that league. <laughs> so tell me about the book. What What led you on that journey? Well, you know, uh, once again, connections. Um, my best friend is a guy named Alistair Thompson, who's a great guitar player himself. Um, he played, uh, he was in Crash Kelly with me. But he's, uh, his, his new gig is he's a book editor, and uh, he works in the publishing business. And he's known, I've had a, he's, he's, he's been subject to my long rants on Canadian heavy metal music and heavy metal music in general. And, you know, we toured together for a long time. So he said, hey, man, you got a story there. Like, you know, we should really try and pitch a book. So we, we sat down and, and, and you know, I, I'm a music junkie myself. I, I love reading the biographies and I own every book that comes out mm-hmm. on the subject. And I, uh, I never saw anything written in the Canadian history books about the bands that I grew up with. I didn't read about Helix, Fengali, Brighton Rock. I didn't see about any of these bands. So I felt I wanted to write a book uh, to, to honor them and to, and to find out whether their ambitions and goals and dreams are the same as mine. And Alistair had this idea to bring it to his publisher. We put a, we put a, a story outline together. And uh, lo and behold, they went for it. And Dunder and Press ended up putting out the Metal on Ice book. So that's, that's where it came from. And it's done quite well for you, yeah? It's doing well, you know. It's, it's getting out there. Great reviews. Um, um, yeah, and you know, and, and it continues to, and it launched this whole other thing because, like I mentioned before, I uh, I work at Coalition Music in Toronto. And, you know, they have a label through Warner, and they heard me talking about it. And Rob Laney and Eric Lawrence, co-founders of the company, are from that era. And well, why aren't we doing an album with this? Okay. <laughs> and then, hey, why aren't we doing a live show? And then we launched a whole Pledge Music campaign, and now we've got you know this whole whole thing happening, and. Uh, uh, when's this going to air, Brian? Uh, this will be uh, not this Monday, but the following Monday. Okay, so I can announce this then. We're going to be having the, the Metal on Ice show uh, in Toronto at the Opera House, May 10th. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, so the, yeah, we're making the announcement March, uh, March 5th, but that will pass by then. <laughs> and is that going to so, be everybody, everybody from the record going to be there, plus more? You got it. And, and, and who knows? Maybe plus more. But basically what we're going to do is we've got Christopher Ward hosting. Uh, oh. We're going to make like the loudest book release party ever <laughs> <laughs> and bring this whole thing, this whole experience uh, together. And, you know, I'd love to see the Metal and Ice thing turn into a show we do once in a while because it's like what we're calling it an electric storyteller's concert. And that's what it is. This isn't just seeing these guys perform their songs. It's, it's, it's getting context for the songs themselves and that story of tapestry of Canadian rock and roll and the touring circuits and, you know, the early pioneers of American deals, all these things. Um, and that, that, that's really what it is. And, and I guess what it really is is an excuse to play with all your heroes. Logistically, it would be a nightmare, but that's definitely a show that could tour. You could play, you know, nice-sized theaters, at least across Canada, and then perhaps have, like, a Q&A at the end. And people go crazy for it. Yeah, and all these things are being worked out. That that's that's exactly it. And and, and really, these are these, these are all comrades in arms. We actually, um, the Metal and Ice EP was re-records of uh, of of the hits of the time with the Very original singers. Ones. But well, you know what, man, it was one of those things that we wanted to give it a sonic boost. But but you can't touch those arrangements. Like, you, yeah. what am I gonna too loud McLeod solo different than him? No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a ma- that, that that's that's like messing with the notes in a Bach Takata, you just don't do it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it had to be that way, uh, and so yeah, we, we we did we did do pretty faithful versions. But yeah, um, we we all got together to. Uh, Nick Walsh actually pushed me to write a new song with him for the uh, for the album. So we actually wrote a metal on ice theme, 
and he actually produced the track and brought all the vocalists together. We brought them all the coalition, and seeing them all together uh, just just kind of highlighted that sense of camaraderie, having been through this whole thing, you know. And it's so cool. That leads us up to I would say the uh, the Kiss tribute record because that seemed to snowball into a whole bunch of cool things for you. So let's start with Mitch's uh, Mitch reaching out for you for that record. How how was that process? Well, Mitch, Mitch has been a good friend and he was a real supporter of Crash Kelly. And like I said, he got me into Helix. I got, you know, there's nothing I wouldn't do for Mitch LaFont. And, you know, when he, when he brought this idea of the World with Heroes CD to me, and especially in light of what it was for, which was uh, the cancer hospice in Montreal, there was, it was a no brainer. I was like, what, whatever you need. So he suggested the song forever and he uh, actually hooked me up with terry ellis uh from band xyz xyz in canada uh <laughs> and, great white and, as well uh, now. And, great, and great white yeah and terry is an unbelievable singer and i'm so proud of what we did um i tracked the guitars here with my buddy tim welch uh recording uh tim from national velvet and Atlanta miles and asylum and a million other bands mm, yeah uh, yeah, um, and uh, sent it to Terry, and Terry got the vibe right away, and we just kind of locked in musically. Um, he actually uh, ended up getting his friend George Tutcote to mix it. George has worked with so many people, Rod Stewart, million, millions of people, fantastic artists, uh, and, and put this nice version together, and I was very proud of it. And Mitch had also reached out to... Uh, to, to John Reagan and, and your buddy Todd Howarth as well and had them do songs. And, you know, that led to something very cool as I'm sure you're going to ask. About. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Four by fate. Uh, I got to say, I've been watching uh, the progression and people are really excited. There's a lot of people who are really happy to see this project come together. Well, you know, it's funny. I was a big Fraley's Comet fan. Like I remember reading, you know, hit parader and circus yeah. and i was like and see those ads and, and i remember the artwork was the first thing that struck me i was like oh this is so cool and then going and, and grabbing grabbing that first fraley's comet record it's exciting and the live album and i, I thought they were great right yeah, um but uh never thinking that down the road i'd be working with them but uh you know mitch mitch once again had this idea to look at man ace probably isn't going to be putting the, the comet back together like i mean be great to hear have you guys go out and play and that started dialogue between john and todd and myself and we just hit it off as people like mm -hmm. just through n numerous conversations we realized we wanted the same thing we wanted to play in a kick-ass rock and roll band with seasoned pros that are only going to play the right gigs we're not going to go out there and, and suffer we've, we've paid our dues we, we we don't need to do that uh so we, we just said we're going to have a high-end rock and roll band that plays aggressive but super melodic stuff and the number one rule is we've got to have a lot of laughs a lot of great meals together we've got to just this has to be pure enjoyment across the board and we all agreed on that um and, and that led uh john to reach out to his friend danny stanton uh, danny from the great company Collier Entertainment, who I've actually been, I've been an admirer of Danny and his work for years. Like, you know, what he's done with the careers of like, you know, helping Twisted Sister and Wasp and, you know, he works with Foreigner and the Babies, you name it. Yeah. He, he's, he's such, he's such a great guy and, and he's such a passionate guy. He, the guy never stops working. And he suggested Stet Howland. And I actually met Stet years ago when Crash Kelly opened for Wasp. Mm -hmm. And then again, at a NAMM show, man, Stet. And it's so funny because Vollmer from Helix, Brian had just told me, or Stead Howland in Florida, what a great guy. Like all these things were swirling around. I said, man, this is really meant to happen. Yeah. And, you know, we all got on board and we're all in together and we're all just kind of working hard in our individual corners. And how much fun is it that we actually get to build this band with the fans? Like the this the fans are on board from the beginning. Oh, huge, yeah. They're watching the whole the whole process. They're they're, they're involved in creating the set list. Like their their, their input is is inspiring us and and I'm blown away by the response. And man, I have a real responsibility. I feel to live up to um, to the legacy of what these other guys have done. Like you know, uh, I I feel so honored to be included in this. You know, um, so I'm excited, humbled, and uh, very optimistic about Four by Fate's future. 
Yeah, I'm just, I'm just really, as you know, like I, I've known Todd for a long time and I've always been really frustrated and pissed off for him <laughs> because right. the guy is so talented and he, his career never took off the way it should have. And he was doing, he was ahead of his time, I think, when he was doing these little independent records, but there was no proper distribution method like there is today. Yeah. You know, like mid 90s, he self produced in CDs when there's not much you can do with it, you know? And, uh, and those right. records are great. They're great. And nobody's heard them. Like, nobody knows this guy's been making music this whole time. And his chops are as good as ever, and his voice is amazing. Uh, and then to see, like, I think what he always needed was to get into a proper band with a bunch of equals and kind of divide and conquer and put it all together, uh, the full package. And, and that's what he's got now. So I'm really excited for him. Well, me too. And and I'm, I'm going to tell you, like, I, I was actually just last night working on some of the uh, the back catalog that we're going to be playing in, in, in concert. And man, his harmonic sensibility, he really has his own thing as a player. Mm. It's his oh, totally. post-Van Halen meets abstract. It's quite phenomenal. And, uh, man, I've got to really, you know, rise to the occasion to find a way to complement this stuff. But, um, uh, you know, just from even our little Skype jams, I, I just feel like we're, we're, we're sympathetic players. And uh, and I'm very excited. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're coming to tear the playhouse down. There's no doubt about it. It's like we're going to be raising the bar and we're going to be coming hard on those stages. So I'm really, really excited. Any hint to what's, uh, on the set list you're willing to share? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to say, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's over now that I won't tell you anything. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was something moved inside me when I started to work with these guys. And, uh, you know, it's a real breakout situation. I, I don't know, man. Well, then, it's it's going to be it's going to be some usual suspects with a whole bunch of surprises. But what I'm really excited about is getting in writing with these guys because we're all writers. We're producers. Yeah. We are, you know, we're people who who who. Uh, really enjoy the process and what i think the classic rock world needs is people a band that say hey look it we are unapologetically going to do all these things that you want us to we're going to make a record why because we want to make records yeah. not because the market dictates it hell with that we like making records we want to put the artwork together we want to go out and do live albums we want to like we you know i i think what this band has is the ability to play rock and roll and I don't. I, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but properly, it's yeah. proper rock and roll played by people who've dedicated their lives to it. And uh, we're not chasing trends. We are playing a classic form of music that I think fans and I think the response is that yeah, we want this. <laughs> people want this, and we're gonna go to those people. And I can't wait to do it. And you guys are going to New York soon, right? To begin it all. Yeah, man. In April, like we're gonna be filming everything, documenting everything. Can't wait for that downbeat, you know? Like, that's, I feel like I'm Rocky in Rocky IV. I'm in the wilderness right now training because I got to go in there and throw down. And, and with the, the way technology's changed, you know, you can get together and write a bunch of stuff or you can do it all remotely and each do your parts. Absolutely. Hey, man, I'm going to do my, my guitar parts for the Helix record, you know, satellite from the guys. But, I mean, we have the, the communication tools and it's the same thing with this band. You know, we don't have to stop and have our creative process be reliant on us physically being in the same room. Um, although I got to be honest, I, I'll do anything to make that work. Cause I do think there's something that happens when you're all in there, oh, yeah, you know, totally. but we, we can grab beds like that and put the bells and whistles on. Who knows? Technology does allow us a lot of ways to do that. Cause I was talking to Darren Smith about that and he was telling me about recording uh, vocals for the Jakey Lee record. And, and he was in Toronto and they were in Vegas on Skype. You know, and right. it and it was fine. And and I also read that Springsteen recorded his new album the same way. His producer was in L.A. and he was down in Australia, and it was all done through Skype, and it was totally cool. You know, so yeah, man. that's it. That's it. You know, at the end of the day, good music makes its own friends, and the songs are gonna come out. Uh, good songs will come out no matter which way you, you get it down. Now, one thing we didn't, you mentioned it quickly, you know, as we're, you know, wrap it up in a couple of minutes, but you, you mentioned, what's his face, uh, from Guts N' Roses playing in his band. You were playing oh, Gilby. Bass. Yeah, with Gilby. Uh, uh, just briefly fill me in on that one, because that must be interesting. Oh, yeah, man. Well, once again, 
Pawn Shop Guitar is a very important record to me. I love that record. Oh, yeah, that was a great record. Yeah, and uh, Gilby was my first choice. When we signed with Century Media, they asked me who I wanted to produce the record. I said, Gilby Clark. I want that guy. Because I'd read he'd been doing production, and I love Pawn Shop, and I just said, yeah, that guy. So, it, and oddly enough, the art guy was thinking, that's who I was thinking of. And I had sent Gilby an email uh, through his website. He loved the band. He got the vibe right away. And he produced the Electric Satisfaction and One More Heart Attack records. And Gilby's kind of like, he, he's like a rock and roll big brother to me. He really showed me a lot of stuff. And, um, and you know, we, we hit it off personally. And, uh, you know, the opportunity came up to uh, play in his band. Do a, we were going to do just three Canadian dates, and that ended up turning into a whole South American tour and U.S. dates and, you know, had a blast. And, uh, you know, Greeks. That South American tours with Gilby Clark was like definitely a highlight because you know down there he was like a gold selling artist you know yeah so we were playing some great venues and awesome awesome time Gilby's a great guy he's a brother and and I, I don't know if I you know this but I'm actually going to be playing guitar with Lee Ern as well yeah I saw you're going to do a couple dates with her yeah yeah so that's that's been a blast so I uh, working away on that concurrently with the Four by Fate stuff and. It's just having so much fun. I'm also, I, I've got a great, great acoustic duo with Carl Dixon too, called the classic rock campfire. And I've, I, you know, I, I played with Carl and subbed in on a few Coney dates and, you know, I, I, it's so much fun to get to play with your heroes. I don't, I'm very fortunate. So you do, Oh, I'm trying to keep it all in my head right now. You, you got uh helix, you got four by fate, you got your acoustic duo, you've got Lee Aaron, <laughs> you've got uh metal on ice. Uh, you're still teaching. Yep. And yep. you have a family. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And then the coalition music gig. The coalition music. <laughs> yeah. So do you sleep? Not much, but you know what? Why sleep? <laughs> you know, all the good stuff happens when you're, you know, when you're wait. <laughs> all the good stuff happens that night. Yeah. You know, I got to tell you, if you take party out of the equation, you, you end up having a lot more time in your day. <laughs> True. True enough. Yeah. No, I, you know what? It's just so much fun for me. I, I don't want to miss a thing. <laughs> Well, Sean, thanks a lot for your time. This is a great chat. Yeah, appreciate it, Brian. Good luck with 4 by Fate and your 18 other projects. Hey, man, thanks. You know, I got, I got to tell you, it's, uh, it seems like a lot, but it's actually quite manageable. And, uh, and I feel very fortunate for all of it. And thanks a lot and all the best with the show, man. I'm loving it. And there you have it. Another episode of the Double Stop Podcast. Subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode. We'll see you next Monday.